So really, would your food choices pay off in heart health? Did you know that when you replace bad fats with healthier fats, like those in canola or other vegetable oils, it can lower bad cholesterol levels, and that's good for your heart. Here's a winning idea. Take up the challenge for good health, because the you of the future will say, Fantastic! Learn more at heart.org slash face the fats. Canola Info proudly supports the American Heart Association's Face the Fats campaign. WMN, with more of what you need to know, listen for the Alicia Marie Fit Show, a legal, political, and social conversation, Tuesday nights at 7 on AM 1470, WMN. I'm Eric Martin. Wow, it's a blistering hot day and with a special weather tip on the importance of heat awareness, here's Katie Upton. Katie? As we all know, it can get really hot and humid here in Florida. Warning signs for heat exhaustion are confusion, headache, weakness, fatigue, cramps, nausea, and rapid heartbeat. To avoid these conditions, wear loose clothing, drink plenty of water, and stay safe in the sun. Brought to you by the Florida Division of Emergency Management, the Florida Association of Broadcasters, and this radio station. This is Talk 1470. Talk 1470. WNN. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Welcome to Muska Law Radio, a program dedicated to criminal defense with attorney John Muska. Mr. Muska has offices throughout Florida, including Broward and Palm Beach counties, and has devoted his legal career to representing clients on all criminal defense matters. Mr. Muska has been a member in good standing with the Florida Bar since 1999. He is a lifetime member of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and Normal. In 2012, he was selected as a rising star by Super Lawyers, a distinct reserved to the top two and a half percent of all criminal lawyers in Florida. For the past four years, Mr. Muska has been designated one of the top 100 trial lawyers in Florida by the National Trial Lawyers Association. He also enjoys a perfect 10 rating with AVO, a respected independent lawyer rating organization. If you or someone you know is under investigation or accused of a crime, or if you have any questions related to criminal law, you don't want to miss today's show with attorney John Muska. To watch this show stream live, visit www. Dot muscalaw.com and click on the radio link. Now, here's attorney John Muska. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here this evening. Good evening, South Florida and listeners everywhere. Pleasure to be here, really. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the first show of its kind. Uh, this is our first presentation, our first show, and I wanted to welcome everybody. Uh, the, 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 the first question I want to I want to answer is why did I decide to why did I decide to do the program? And, and, and the answer is, is very simple, uh, because I enjoy what I do. And I feel that the purpose of this program could be best served by educating the public and, and doing everything that, that I can to relay my experience, uh, what I've learned over the past uh, 15 years practicing law, and uh, what I could do to help others. And, and truly, that's why I'm here. Um, so uh, give us a shout. We're at one 565 one four seven zero. You can call into the show. We'll take your calls live, and uh, I'll do the best I can to answer your questions within my limitations. In other words, there's certain questions that I will not be able to answer. So, uh, on account of regulatory reasons, if I'm if I decline to answer, I, I hope to not offend or insult anybody. But please understand that those are the rules and the limitations that we work under. Uh, however, uh, there is quite a bit of, of of content material that we can cover in the hour of time that we have together here this evening. So once again, 1-888-565-1470. Feel free to call into the show and ask me any questions you may. The, uh, the, second, the second question that I, that I get asked a lot, and probably the most common question when I, when I meet people in public and elsewhere, why did I uh, become a defense lawyer and how can I defend somebody that I know is guilty? The answer to me is very simple. Everybody is entitled to a complete defense. If you're accused of a crime in the state of Florida, in any state, in this country, you're presumed innocent by law. That means that the law must presume that you did not commit the offense un unless or until the prosecutor is able to satisfy the burden and prove beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt that, that, uh, uh, that, that you should be convicted. So 
uh, that's my answer. And and the counter argument to that, and what what other people would say is, uh, well, again, you know, that's all fine and good, but how can you defend somebody that you know is guilty? And my answer is, I didn't draft the Constitution; our forefathers did. And when I was admitted to the bar, I took an oath to support the Constitution. And part of that says that, uh, that, that I'm going to defend the honor of, of those that are accused and, and, and those that are uh, less fortunate. And I did that for two, uh, close to two years as a public defender, where I think I, I, I really started uh, developing my passion for this line of work. And, um, and uh, everyone's presumed innocent, and that's, that's a key thing to remember. Now, with respect to the areas of practice that we're going to cover today, uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the criminal law process, okay, from beginning to end. Um, first, I think it's important to recognize that when, when someone is arrested for a criminal offense, whatever type that is, uh, that they're, they're merely arrested and charged by the sheriff's office. They have not formally filed charges. That's, that's something that a lot of people don't understand. There, there, is a st there are stages to the criminal process. The first stage is the arresting and the booking stage. Uh, and, and that's when the sheriff's office makes a decision to charge. So, for example, if somebody is, is stopped for a DUI arrest and, and is, uh, is cited for DUI, uh, at that point, the sheriff's office gathers their information together. They marshal together their evidence, the arrest materials, uh, the person is then arrested, and then, uh, and then they're entitled to a bond. Uh, every person that's arrested in the state of Florida uh, is entitled to be brought before the court within 24 hours of the date of the arrest uh, for the purposes of setting bond and for the purpose of determining if there's probable cause to warrant their detention. That's the first step. Um, once the person is arrested, uh, then... Uh, some people are able to financially afford a bond and some people are not. Those that are not uh, have to remain in custody until their case is resolved or disposed of. Those who, who are able to afford a bond uh, post bond and then they await their first court date which is called the arraignment date. The arraignment date is the date on or by which the prosecutor is ob obligated to make a formal filing decision. So this would be more or less the second stage. Um, again, here, the prosecutor makes the formal filing decision, not the sheriff's office. So the prosecutor will then receive the information from the sheriff's office and, and make a decision on, on, uh, on whether to pursue f formal criminal charges by filing what's called an information in the state of Florida uh, or declining prosecution. Um, in most cases that reach the prosecutor uh, at, that, at that stage, uh, the prosecutors decide to go ahead and file formal criminal charges. Um, and it's at that point that the, that the formal uh, action gets set into motion in court. Um, many people ask me about the arraignment date. Do, do I have to attend my arraignment date? Under the rules of, of criminal procedure, uh, we are allowed to, as defense lawyers, to waive your appearance at the arraignment by filing a waiver of appearance. Um, we also, in preparation for the arraignment, file a, a not guilty plea uh, uh, as defense lawyers. It, it would be a not guilty plea, not a, not a guilty plea. If it's a guilty plea, you don't need a defense lawyer. Um, so we would then, in preparation for the arraignment, file a not guilty plea. We would then file a, a demand for all the evidence, a notice to participate in discovery, as well as a demand to request a copy of the charging document. Those, those filings are typically prepared and registered with the clerk of court prior to and in anticipation of the arraignment date. Uh, once the clerk's office receives that information, uh, then the arraignment is, the purpose of the arraignment is, is then satisfied, and then uh, the clerk's office will then assign another court date. So ordinarily for the typical criminal case, there are a series, series of court dates um, on misdemeanor cases, we are able to typically file a waiver of not only the arraignment but also the pretrial conferences uh, to allow defense counsel to represent the interests of the accused in court so that they don't have to physically appear and show up. Um, although some judges 
uh, in certain areas would require you to appear in either case. Uh, so definitely make sure that you consult with your defense attorney first before you decide to just not show up to court. Um, the, the next stage after the pretrial conferences, we move toward a trial date. Um, judges typically uh, like to get cases moving along. Um, they don't like cases on their docket for an extended period of time, and defense lawyers know it. Um, so whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor, uh, we're, we're moving constantly toward resolution. We're, we're speaking with prosecutors in ongoing dialogue. We're, we're engaging witnesses. We're, we're setting up and identifying pretrial uh, issue, uh, issues for pretrial motions that we can file. We're participating in the discovery process. We're doing everything we can to move toward a resolution on the case that's favorable for our client. That may be a trial. It may not be a trial. It really all depends on, on the strengths and, and, and weaknesses of the state's case and, and, and what we're able to, to gather and what we're able to do as defense lawyers throughout that process in strengthening and bolstering our case. We're going to take a brief commercial break, and we'll be right back with you. Times are tough, and right now those in the commercial world know that being heard via advertisements is the name of the game. AmpSquare.tv understands how important advertisement is and is proud to express that it's truly the only plugged-in internet television production company on the market. Amp2.tv live streams all their shows across all the major selling markets in the U.S. and abroad. Call them at 866-224-5422. The AmpSquare.tv library allows productions to be seen over and over again, making commercial platforms more usable. Call 866-224-5422. Toll free 866-224-5422. Amp2.tv, the first and only internet television network that's truly plugged in. 866-224-5422. That's A-M-P, the number two, dot TV. I have a passion for the environment. That's why I mountain bike. I love being in the woods, on near vertical trails. I relish the challenge when I can appreciate the best nature has to offer. So it was only natural that I would choose a career in the elements where I can make a difference. That's why I serve in the United States Coast Guard. We monitor commercial vessels, making sure our ports and waterways are safe and clean from oil or other hazardous material. We patrol our fisheries and protect marine wildlife and their habitats. With all we do, it's about protecting America. This is a lot like mountain biking. It's always exciting to navigate through the next challenge. Were you born ready to protect America, our environment, our resources, our people? Learn more at GoCoastGuard.com. Sponsored by the United States Coast Guard in cooperation with the Florida Association of Broadcasters and this station. I try to fit in, but being made out of insects and bugs, it's not easy. They call me invasive species or hungry pests. Yeah, like I don't have feelers. I mean feelings. Sometimes I have to turn the other cheek from the one made of flies to the one made of beetles. You should think of me as a culinary tourist. I'm just trying to eat my way through Florida. Your trees and crops, there's so much to tempt me. I manage, thanks to the people who help me get around, mostly on the things they move and pack. Hungry pests? Yeah, I'm hungry. Who can blame me? You do put out quite a spread. I'd ask you to join me for a bite, but there's really only enough for me. <laughs> Hungry pests are invasive insects and pests that threaten to devour Florida's trees and crops. It's up to each of us to leave hungry pests behind. Go to HungryPests.com and get the facts. That's HungryPests.com. A message from the USDA. What do you want to be when you're older? Hold on, this is like a deep question. Uh... When I'm older, I want to be a singer. That's, that's my goal. I'm not sure I want to invent the supercomputer, but I definitely want to build the supercomputer. I want to be an inspiration. An organizer of, of like, do-gooders. I want to be a veterinarian. I want to help out animals and work with them. I want to be a media mogul. Just rule the world. When I'm older, I want to be anything but the one that doesn't fit in. The one that people don't love. 
Everyone deserves a dream. Everyone. But some of us are depressed. Anxious. Scared. Angry. Alone. Don't feel like ourselves. We can't even focus on the present, much less the future. If that's you, say something. It's okay to talk. It's okay to share. It's okay to get help or help someone. Talk to someone. It, it helps. And people, people will listen. Add your voice at oktotalk.org. Oktotalk.org. Brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters. You have been listening to attorney John Muska of Muska Law with offices throughout Florida, including Broward and Palm Beach County. If you have questions about criminal law or related matters, call into the show at 1-888-565-1470. Join us every Thursday at 4 p.m. for Muska Law Radio, a program dedicated to all criminal defense matters. Joining us live now in our studio, here's attorney John Muska. Thank you, Blake. Welcome back, South Florida and listeners everywhere. Running into some difficulties streaming live on www.muscalaw.com. We expect to have that up shortly. Um, I wanted to get back a little bit to what we were talking earlier about waiving, uh, waiving appearances at, uh, at, at court dates. Um, the, I spoke earlier about misdemeanors. Typically, uh, that is acceptable. Uh, we are able to waive your appearance at, at, at pretrial conferences and status checks. Um, felonies, ordinarily though, not so not so fortunate. Um, we can file a waiver of your appearance at the first court date, which is the arraignment date, but not ordinarily at subsequent court dates uh, for felony charges, uh, unless or until they're reduced to lesser offenses. Uh, when we could step in, obviously, and and uh, and and file waivers in those cases. I have uh, joining me live attorney Marquin Renard who is a 30-year uh, criminal defense attorney, veteran. Uh, he's been practicing law for quite a long time. Mark, when are you with us? I am, John. Okay, thank you for joining us. Um, Mark, when the, the, uh, we're, we're, we're talking a little bit about the, the criminal law process. Uh, I, I covered the, uh, the arrest, uh, you know, from the arrest to the uh, arraignment stage to the pretrial conference stage on both misdemeanors and, and felonies. We're, we're, we're speaking about waivers. Um, waivers are ordinarily acceptable in misdemeanor cases, but not on felony cases. And we're talking about how uh, we're, we're moving toward the resolution stage, be it either a trial or uh, a resolution vis-a-vis -a, -vis a plea. Um, once again, a, a, attorney Mark Renard joining us live, a 30-year criminal defense attorney veteran. Um, Mark, when I want to, I want to take a, a break from talking about the criminal law process a little bit and kind of just ask you about uh, about your experience as a defense lawyer. You're a full-time associate of Muska Law at this point, and and you know, I want to, I'd like to see how you would handle this question that a lot of people ask me, uh, almost invariably, <laughs> all the time. Uh, how how can you defend somebody that you know is guilty? Well. <coughs> Everyone has the right to be proven guilty, and our job as a defense attorney is, is pretty much, in my opinion, to check and balance on the entire criminal justice system. Uh, everyone has the, the, uh, the job to perform. Everyone uh, has the right, if they're charged with a crime, to be defended. And I'll start with, I can't say that I know someone is guilty. A person may come in and say, I've been arrested for this offense, and I'm guilty, I did it. But they may have a misconception of what the law is and what the requirements are uh, in order to actually be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of a specific crime. So uh, it's not really my position to have an opinion as to whether a person is guilty or not, but... Uh, it, it's oftentimes difficult to know that a person is guilty because they really don't know if they've committed a criminal offense or not. Uh, but sometimes the criminal defense isn't about getting a person off, but it's about getting a just result in the case, a just result for everyone involved. And part of defense is, is to reach that goal, is to reach a resolution which is just. I certainly would not want to be judged on the worst day of my life. And oftentimes that's the, the case that we find our clients in, is that they are good people, they're honest people, they've been hardworking, 
uh, they made a mistake. They had the worst day of their life. And I have no problems or difficulties at all defending someone or representing someone uh, who had the worst day of their life, but it was an abnormal day for them. And to, and to search out and to find mitigation and to present that mitigation to the prosecutors in order to reach a just and fair result for everyone involved. So uh, it's not only that everyone is entitled to representation, uh, but it's, it's also that, that just because a person is charged with a crime and just because they might actually be guilty of that crime doesn't mean that they, they aren't entitled to have someone represent their interests, uh, to be their advocate, to present uh, mitigation, to present their side of the story, and to reach the best possible, possible result for them. Thank you. Uh Mark, when you've you've defended uh, you 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 began your career as a public defender. How ma how many years did you serve as a public defender? Uh, I believe it was a total of about sixteen or seventeen years. Okay, and, and and in that capacity, you represented hundreds of people accused of a wide range and and and, and gamut of of criminal offenses, ranging from. Uh, simple misdemeanor, second-degree misdemeanor cases, breach of peace, all the way up to and including uh, uh, serious uh, sex offenses, uh, capital sexual battery, and the like. Correct? That's correct. Okay. And w what what would you what would you regard as uh, the most real challenge that that, that you faced um, on on any matter that you've represented? In other words, is there is there a particular case that stands out in your mind or? Uh, do you approach all the cases the same way? Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, I, I would like to think that I approach all the cases in the same way, but, but uh, that's probably not true. Uh, not necessarily a specific case, but a specific type of cases. Uh, and the specific type of case would be those involving uh, clients that have been charged with inappropriate sexual contact with children. Uh, those are difficult cases uh, simply because of the nature of the charge. Uh, the uh, charge itself presents challenges as far as if you're going to go to trial and, and selecting a jury. Um, there's often the jurors have in their mind questions that they want answered by, by the defense. Uh, even though the defense doesn't have a burden, and those questions are generally, why would a child lie or say something that happened when it didn't happen? And how would a child of a young age, you know, anywhere from 8 to 12, 13 years old, how would they have knowledge of sexual acts unless the thing that they're claiming happened to them actually happened? Uh, so the, the type of case is a difficult case simply because the, it, it's difficult uh, on most occasions to, to get jurors who can put aside any preconceived ideas or notions that they have and to look at the case based solely upon the evidence that's presented and the law that the judge gives them. Uh, there are also difficult cases because you have clients that you, know, you asked earlier about how do you defend a client that you know is guilty. Well, the tougher question is how do you defend a client who you know is not guilty that faces a serious charge like that and you know that, that, that literally their life is in your hands because if convicted they could go to prison for the rest of their lives. And you know in your heart, you, you know from what you have discovered through the evidence that the allegation just isn't true. And it's not true uh, perhaps because it's a child who doesn't like being under the restrictions of the parent and wants to find a way out of those restrictions. It's a child who uh, unfortunately finds themselves in the position of being used as a pawn in a custody battle. Uh, it, it's, it's those types of cases, the, the, the sexual cases that deal with child as, as a, a child as a victim of a crime that, that I find the most difficult because no matter what the circumstances are, there, there really isn't a winner in the case and the, the child is, is ultimately a loser. Uh, the, the child is, is not going to come out victorious if the defendant is found guilty and the defendant really did it. 
And there's some, there's some um, satisfaction, I suppose, uh, for, for the conviction, but ultimately there's still a lifelong uh, effect that's going to be on that child. If the child has made something up that's resulted in a, a client being sentenced to a period of time in prison, if the child was used by the other parent as a pawn, the, ch the child is still the victim in that case, and it's still going to have long-lasting effects on them. So uh, the, the, the long answer, I guess, to your short question is, is that it's not really a specific case that comes to mind, but a specific type of case. And, and the, the Any? cases that involve children as victims, especially in the sexual area uh, of the law, are extremely difficult cases. And each case, indeed, is a challenge. Uh, you have uh, represented uh, folks on serious sex crime allegations with no physical evidence, uh, merely uh, someone saying that it happened. Um, those, those, t those, those cases uh, would, would be flimsier than, than most, though, at that point, without physical evidence? Uh, those cases are the most difficult to deal with your clients on because... They, like most people, think that, well, there's no evidence. They, they don't have an appreciation or an understanding that someone's word is evidence and someone's word is enough as evidence uh, to result in a conviction if that word is believed. Uh, but uh, those, are, those are the most trying types of cases where uh, it's involved in a he said, she said type of thing where the jury has to has to come to a conclusion as to who they believe and whether or not if it's the uh, alleged victim in the case that they believe, do they believe them beyond and to the exclusion of, of a reasonable doubt. Uh, and any parent who has more than one child knows how difficult it is if something happens in the house and you don't know which child did it and they're both denying it, it's difficult at times to know which child is telling the truth and what child's not telling the truth. And certainly, there's uh, there's other motivations involved too, Mr. Renard, that I that I've encountered uh, many times. Uh, uh, there there's a split family. There's a divorced couple. Uh, one one is trying to gain leverage uh, by telling you know uh, trying to, to to coach the uh, the little girl or or the little boy for that matter. Um, and, and I, I think it's important. Again, you know, we go back to to the same uh, the same principle. Uh, all are presumed innocent unless or until the state is able to meet the burden of proof. Um, we spoke earlier. I explained to the listening audience uh, some time ago about the stages of the criminal process as far as the the intake with the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office would gather the information, and then it would be moved on to. Uh, the prosecutor to make a formal filing decision. Uh, there is always that limited window of opportunity in between the, the, the point of the arrest and the arraignment date, which is the date that the prosecutor makes a filing decision, uh, for, uh, for defense lawyers to, to possibly make a difference as far as influencing that, that, that filing decision to avoid uh, criminal charges from being filed. Um, and, and we have seen that uh, in, in our office uh, with uh, with those that have, have been accused of uh, of serious sex offenses or, or non-serious sex offenses, although I don't know any sex offense allegation that is non-serious, um, so you know it, it, it is important uh, if if you're accused of uh, of any criminal offense, be it uh, DUI, uh, you know, sex sex offense, drug-related matters, domestic violence, battery, crimes of aggression, it is important that you seek counsel as soon as possible. There is absolutely no benefit or value or advantage to delaying uh, the sooner the better. The analogy I use uh, is, is it's, like a, it's like a cancer. The sooner you can get an attorney on it, the sooner your odds are of, of, of either, either beating it or at least mitigating the damage and, and keeping it under control. We're back live, 1470 WNN Radio in moments. Times are tough, and right now those in the commercial world know that being heard via advertisements is the name of the game. AmpSquare.tv understands how important advertisement is and is proud to express that it's truly the only plugged-in internet television production company on the market. 
Amp2.tv live streams all their shows across all the major selling markets in the U.S. and abroad. Call them at 866-224-5422. The AmpSquare.tv library allows productions to be seen over and over again, making commercial platforms more usable. Call 866-224-5422. Toll free 866-224-5422. Amp2.tv, the first and only internet television network that's truly plugged in. 866-224-5422. That's A-M-P, the number two, dot TV. America's service members and veterans are strong, forged out of bravery, sacrifice, and duty. They are diverse, unique, from all corners of the country, and thanks to their common experience, a family for life. But whether they served in lands far away or communities close to home, some of these men and women may face difficult times or even crisis. But sometimes, reaching out for help can be the most challenging and worthwhile mission of all for veterans, service members, reserve, and National Guard. Thankfully, friends, family, and communities are standing by their service members and veterans now more than ever. We're all in this together. When you recognize something isn't right, make the call to the Veterans Crisis Line or Military Crisis Line. During times of crisis, reach out and call. Dial 1-800-273-8255 and press 1 or chat online at veteranscrisisline.net or text 838-255. The thought of my sons growing up without me inspired me to quit smoking. I talked to my doctors and then I threw away all my cigarettes, ashtrays, and lighters. I started exercising instead of smoking. Getting support from friends online kept me on track. Staying away from alcohol when I was first quitting was key. Instead of smoking after I ate, I'd get up and take a walk. I missed having a cigarette in my hand, so I'd hold a pen or a straw, anything. Until I knew I wouldn't give in to temptation, I spent more time with my friends who didn't smoke. I went to places that were smoke-free. I didn't stay quit the very first time I tried. I kept on trying, and I learned something each time. Do whatever it takes. No matter how many times it takes. I quit. I quit. I quit. We did it. So can you. You can quit. For free help, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and CDC. I'm in almost every school bus and classroom. I go to school with your children. We say the Pledge of Allegiance together. You see me around the neighborhood and you tell me that I'm a pretty good kid. Well, I'm one out of every five children in America, and I'm struggling with hunger. This problem is closer than you think. My teacher tells me we can grow up to be whatever we want. I want to grow up to be someone who doesn't go to bed hungry. There's enough food in this country to feed everybody. Please visit feedingamerica.org today and find your local food bank for ways to help. Every dollar you donate helps provide eight meals for kids like me, quietly struggling with hunger. Together, we are Feeding America. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. There are many sounds in your day-to-day -day life. There are sounds that wake you up. Sounds that make you smile. Sounds that energize you. and sounds that help you relax. But there are some sounds that can alert you to danger and can help save lives. Wireless emergency alerts, now on many mobile devices, use a unique sound and vibration to bring you information about severe weather events, amber alerts, or other emergencies in your area. With critical information from local sources you know and trust, you can be in the know, wherever you are. For more information, visit ready.gov slash alerts. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council.
have been listening to attorney John Muska of Muska Law with offices throughout Florida, including Broward and Palm Beach County. If you have questions about criminal law or related matters, call into the show at 1-888-565-1470. Join us every Thursday at 4 p.m. for Muska Law Radio, a program dedicated to all criminal defense matters. Joining us live now in our studio, here's attorney John Muska. Thank you again, Blake. Welcome back to the show, 1470 AM WNN. Uh, joining me is attorney Mark Wynn Renard. Mark Wynn, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're going to segue now. We, I, I, we appreciate your comments on uh, sex crime defense and uh, how delicate those matters are. Uh, I am impressing upon the uh, listening audience, uh, all South Florida and elsewhere, of the importance to consult an attorney as soon as you can, as soon as one can. Uh, if, if they're in a position of being accused of uh, any, any type of, of matter, really, uh, it, but, but especially of the more serious nature. I want to thank you for joining us, Mr. Renard. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I just uh, enjoy the opportunity to be here and, and uh, hope that uh, people will call with questions because I think that there are a lot of questions uh, people have and don't really understand about how the criminal uh, defense bar actually works. And Mr. Renard, that's exactly the, the uh, purpose of the show, to educate the public. We're here every Thursday from 4 to 5 p.m. on WNN AM 1470 Radio. Uh, we're going to transition now, and, and we're going to, uh, to pick up and, and, and speak about something that's very dear to me and something that uh, I have uh, a great deal of experience in, having virtually dedicated my, my career to, um, to representing folks on DUI-related matters. That seems to be... Uh, always uh, a hot topic, something that uh, many people uh, always seem to be discussing uh, everywhere. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I think they're also consulting a million and one different ref resources online and receiving the wrong information. Um, I have uh, I've handled many, many DUI cases in my career. I've managed, evaluated, assessed, and furnished uh, advice on on many of them. Um, and the first the first question I get uh, almost invariably and, and again it's a first program so I'm, I'm, I'm citing the most common questions that I that I receive uh, we will dig deeper and, and and focus on more specific areas of the law uh, later on as we as we move forward uh, the most common question I get is if I ever get stopped do I blow or do I not blow I have an answer for you and some may hem and haw and not give you the right answer but I'm gonna tell you that if you have been drinking and you find yourself behind the wheel and you find yourself in the unfortunate situation of, of being stopped, you absolutely should not blow. Now, the next question becomes, well, won't I lose my license automatically? The answer is yes, but something law enforcement doesn't tell you when they're reading implied consent is that you will be entitled to a, uh, a formal administrative review. In other words, you can challenge the DMV suspension that's handed down. So, for example, somebody is pulled over for DUI. The, the officers ask them to uh, remove themselves from the vehicle, perform field sobriety exercises, and then they ask them to blow. Uh, the person declines. If, the, if you decline, if you refuse to blow, then your license is suspended for one year. Uh, if you do blow, and the legal limit in Florida, of course, is a .08, then your license will be suspended for six months. However, again, law enforcement has not been telling the accused and defendants in this situation for years that what you are entitled to is a formal administrative review hearing and joining me live if we can get her on the phone here is attorney Rebecca Sonalia um, Rebecca has dedicated her practice limits her practice I should say to representing people on formal administrative review hearings that is one one component uh, of, of the case uh, if you're arrested for DUI, of course, there's also the criminal component. So it, it is very important to understand that there are two cases that are created anytime one is arrested under suspicion for DUI in the state of Florida, a DMV case and a criminal DUI case. And joining me live is attorney Rebecca Sonali. Rebecca, how are you? Good afternoon, Mr. Musca. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Ms. Sonalia is a full-time associate of Musca Law. I'm uh, pleased that she was able to take time off, and she is very, very busy, and and I mean that, uh, uh, Rebecca. So thanks for thanks for joining us. 
Rebecca, what is what is the uh, you know ha having dedicated uh, 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 all of your time basically to to representing people on formal administrative review hearings? I discussed with the listening audience moments ago that uh, law enforcement does not tell you that you're entitled to a formal review hearing uh, in the event that you blow uh, over the uh, legal limit, or if you refuse, where you're looking at a, either a uh, six month or a 12 month suspension, respectively. Uh, why do you think law enforcement doesn't 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 tell you that? Well, just to clarify, Mr. Mosco, there are differing periods of the suspension depending upon the history and facts of the case. Um, if it's a first time for blowing over the limit, that would be a six-month suspension. But if it's a second or subsequent offense for blowing over the limit, that would be a one-year license suspension. And in the case of a refusal, a first time refusing the breath, blood, or urine test request would be a one-year suspension whereas a second or subsequent refusal would be an 18-month license suspension. Uh, with regard to uh, the law enforcement uh, aspect of uh, notifying an accused of, of what their rights are to challenge it, uh, there's some fine print on, a, on the DUI citation that's issued to drivers in this situation uh, that notifies the, the driver of the license suspension uh, as well as uh, some fine print that uh, indicates uh, the location of the bureau uh, that they can uh, try to contact uh, to try to do something about this. It's really not very informative, but of course the law enforcement officers uh, do not feel obligated uh, and oftentimes nor are they qualified uh, to explain the legal ramifications uh, of how uh, one might go about um, challenging or addressing. Uh, the license suspension that's been issued uh, on the date of the arrest for either blowing over the limit or refusing to submit to the breath test. Uh, well, what I find a little more interesting is the lack of information provided to somebody uh, about the difference uh, in the consequences uh, if they refuse the breath test or uh, as opposed to taking the breath test and blowing over the limit. The Florida Implied Consent Law uh, obligates the law enforcement officer to notify the driver uh, that their license will be suspended one year for a first-time refusal or 18 months for a second or subsequent refusal, as well as uh, some additional information uh, with regard to uh, the refusal being admissible in court and if it's a second or subsequent refusal. Uh, that it can also be the basis of a, a separate independent misdemeanor charge in the criminal court case. Uh, but the, the, the difference in the length of the suspensions is something that's really um, very rarely ever addressed by the law enforcement officers. Uh, typically, if a driver asks the law enforcement officer, well, I'm having trouble making this decision, you know, uh, somebody who's having, as Mr. Muska referenced earlier, the worst day of their life, uh, and possibly even being intoxicated at that point, although certainly not all of our clients are intoxicated by any means, and they're, they're saddled with a very important legal decision that has ramifications on their future. And the only information that they are being provided to help guide them or, or uh, help them make the decision for themselves is that, okay, well, if you refuse this breath test, your license will be suspended for one year if it's your first time or 18 months if it's a second or subsequent refusal. And the driver, of course, may be thinking, well, what happens if I blow when it's over the limit? Law enforcement officers um, very rarely will answer that question for the driver. Right. And, and I think that's an unfortunate uh, aspect of, of DUI law that um, the, the driver is really forced to make such an important decision without having access to um, to what I think would be important information to to weigh the options and make a, a knowledgeable and intelligent decision. Um, they oftentimes uh, the the driver is is told before the breath test of what the consequences for refusing. So the person may go ahead and, and submit to the breath test then and then be very surprised to find out after they blow over the limit, well, your license is getting suspended anyway. Right. That's, and, 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 and that's, the point, that's the point I'm making there is, is when implied consent is read, uh, by refusing to submit to the breath test, you understand that uh, your license will be suspended for a one-year period of time. Part of that 
implied consent does not indicate that they're entitled to a formal administrative review hearing to challenge a suspension. You're correct. Their, their implied consent law doesn't have any uh, requirement that they be that the driver be notified of, of uh, you know what what opportunities they may have to uh, to challenge it uh, when the person is making the decision of whether to blow or refuse. What they are read is a speech that states the driver's license consequences as well as the additional information about using it in court uh, or it being the basis of a separate, separate misdemeanor offense if it's a second or subsequent refusal. Uh, the, that's the information that is typically available to a driver when they are forced to make the decision of whether to blow or refuse. That's right. Um, and, and it's only after the fact that they may or may not uh, figure out that there are some opportunities, and, and that's why legal counsel is absolutely vital and it's extremely time sensitive as well. Action must be taken within the first 10 days following the date of the arrest or uh, any opportunity to challenge a suspension it is gone forever uh, or to pursue any other uh, avenues uh, that may be available to the driver to seek some relief. And, and, and the time sensitive aspect is, is, is very important. Again, um, we had attorney Mark and Renard on the, on the line moments ago. Uh, and I was indicating to him and the rest of, of, of South Florida here uh, how important it was to uh, secure counsel, obtain counsel, and get them on the case as early as you can. Nowhere is that reality more stark than in the context of the DMV uh, hearing that's, uh, that's needed after a DUI arrest. So for questions, call 1-888-565-1470. We're live, 1470 MM Radio. Uh, 1-888-565-1470. I will say at this time, uh, www.muscalaw.com has had difficulty with their streaming capability. We will be available and have that online for you next Thursday. In the meantime, you can go to www.wnn1470.com to watch us stream live now for the balance of this show. Any questions? Uh, concerning the uh, the DMV part of the uh, after DUI cases, Attorney Rebecca Sonalia has handled hundreds of these cases, um, and is is very fluent, experienced, and qualified uh, to handle these types of matters. Um, moving on, the the other component of the case is is a criminal aspect, and and Rebecca, I'll I'll ask you to elaborate on the, on the two the, the, the two real purposes of the formal hearing first and foremost to challenge the suspension of course uh, and do everything that, we, that 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 defense counsel possibly can to nullify the suspension in the meantime for the most part the person will be entitled to a driving permit throughout that and then and then the other the other purpose of, of, of the DMV challenge of course would be to generate as much evidence and testimony as you can can you can you elaborate uh, on those two uh, on those two purposes a little bit? Yes, I certainly can. I think it is very important for the listening audience to be to understand it to be absolutely clear that when you are arrested for DUI, there's two completely separate actions that have begun and and will proceed. There's the criminal charge of DUI that will proceed in the court before a judge against a prosecutor who is called a, an assistant state attorney, and that assistant state attorney is, is saddled with the goal of trying to prove that the person has committed the law and, and uh, or violated the law and committed the offense of driving under the influence. But completely separate and completely independent of the criminal charges proceeding in the court, there's this automatic DMV driver's license suspension that's effective on the date of arrest for most DUI cases. There are a couple of uh, exceptions to this, but by and large, uh, the, uh, the, the arrestee is typically going to have an automatic license suspension on the front end for either refusing to submit to a breast blood or urine test or for submitting uh, and the results being over the legal limit of 0.08. Very good. In every respect, the criminal court case is completely separate and independent from the DMV driver's license suspension matter. And we're going to and we're going to elaborate a little bit for a little bit later on uh, Rebecca on the on the criminal case uh, having already touched upon the DMV case. We do have Cliff that's calling in from Fort Lauderdale that has a question. Cliff, are you with us? Yes, hi, good afternoon guys. Good afternoon. Thanks very, for joining us. Very very important topic. Um, the 
the um, the question I have, which I have heard um, a lawyer mention before, that if you refuse um, the survival test and you refuse from blowing, they can arrest you because they're going to arrest you anyway, but they can't charge you. I, is that um, is that true? That's, uh, could you shed some light on that? I'll listen up here. Cliff, Cliff, I want to I want to clarify your question. You indicated that that, that if you refuse to blow, are they going to arrest you anyway? Is that your question? Uh, right. Or if you uh, refuse the sobriety test, you're going to be arrested anyway. Okay. So Let um, they can arrest you, but they cannot charge you for that. That's what I heard um, an attorney mm -hmm. said once. No, that's ago. no, that's false. They can arrest you. They will likely arrest you, and you likely will be charged. Uh, Cliff, the the as a general matter, when when somebody is stopped. And the officer develops suspicion that there is th th that the person is driving under the influence. From the very moment that the person is asked to remove themselves from the vehicle, the officer basically has his mind, his or her mind, made up that the person is going to be arrested for DUI. At that point, from the moment that you exit the vehicle, uh, the what law enforcement is doing is is marshaling together as much evidence as they can to lay the foundation for an eventual conviction. Period. Uh, that's. Okay. I thought I thought um, that due to the fact that you refuse everything, then what would be their evidence that you if really if not? if you refuse everything, Cliff. In other words, if if the DUI, if the if the breathalyzer is refused as well as the field sobriety exercises, that's what we loosely refer to as as a double refusal. Uh, then prosecutors go forward on that. They look at they they look at that as an act of defiance. Um, as Attorney Sonalia mentioned earlier on, on your license, there's a uh, uh, according to the prosecutor, there's there's a uh, something that indicates that by operating a motor vehicle, you imp impliedly consent to any field tests or, or sobriety tests required by law enforcement. So if you if you refuse the the field sobriety exercises and and the and the breathalyzer, uh, then then you will likely be arrested and and you will likely be charged. Um, it, it, it's up to your legal team then at that point to step in and take over. What I always say is the streets are public domain. What happens after that? Uh, it's up to your legal team. Uh, but to answer your question, Cliff, I, I appreciate it, and it's a great yeah. question. But to answer it, yes, Thank you very much. more than likely you will be charged. Thanks. Thanks for calling in. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Times are tough, and right now those in the commercial world know that being heard via advertisements is the name of the game. AmpSquare.tv understands how important advertisement is and is proud to express that it's truly the only plugged-in internet television production company on the market. Amp2.tv live streams all their shows across all the major selling markets in the U.S. and abroad. Call them at 866-224-5422. The AmpSquare.tv library allows productions to be seen over and over again, making commercial platforms more usable. Call 866-224-5422. Toll free 866-224-5422. Amp2.tv, the first and only internet television network that's truly plugged in. 866-224-5422. That's A-M-P, the number two, dot TV. My name is Sue Smith. I'm 38 years old, and I work at a graphic design company. Which is funny, because I couldn't even draw a stick figure when I was a kid. But I met someone who told me, you know what? You can do anything if you really want to. And if the teenage me were here, she'd tell you, I wouldn't be into drawing and art if it wasn't for big brothers, big sisters. Most kids from my neighborhood don't get into art. They get into trouble. But I was lucky because my big sister showed me early on that I didn't have to be like most people. And to the young me, that meant a lot. My big sister's name is Sheila, and Sheila is the reason that this eight-year-old grows up to have an amazing job as a graphic designer. Whether you donate money or time, you're helping big brothers, big sisters help a child. And that can last a lifetime. Start something today at bigbrothersbigsisters.org. Brought to you by Big Brothers Big Sisters and the Ad Council. 
You have been listening to attorney John Muska of Muska Law with offices throughout Florida, including Broward and Palm Beach County. If you have questions about criminal law or related matters, call into the show at 1-888-565-1470. Join us every Thursday at 4 p.m. for Muska Law Radio, a program dedicated to all criminal defense matters. Joining us live now in our studio, here's attorney John Muska. Thank you for joining us, South Florida and listeners uh, across the state and elsewhere. Uh, the streaming pu- uh, function, the, the streaming video of this will appear uh, at 5 o'clock uh, due to technical difficulties. Uh, the entire program you could watch on www.muscalaw.com. Click on the radio link um, and, and join us. Um, phone number 888-565-1470 uh, is our number here. Um, I, I just want to, I, I want to, in, in conclusion, summarize, and I thank Cliff for calling in earlier on today. Uh, Cliff brought up a good point. Don't give up evidence. The less evidence you give up, the better. You have an absolute unfettered constitutional right to remain silent. It's very, very important that you honor that. Um, and, and, and we touched upon the legal process today. We're going to do this every Thursday from 4 to 5 p.m. right here on WNN 1470 Radio. Uh, 50,000 watt station broadcasting live each and every time. I want to thank our guest attorney Rebecca Sinalia, full time associate of Muska Law, as well as veteran defense attorney Mark Wynn Renard, 30 year veteran defense attorney. Uh, it's been a pleasure being here. Cliff, you, you are our first caller today. This is our first show, so uh, we are going to be here for you. We want to educate the public as much as we can. God bless you all, and we'll see you all next week. Take care. You've been listening to Muska Law Radio with attorney John Muska with offices throughout Florida, including Broward and Palm Beach County. Join us every Thursday at 4 p.m. right here on 1470 AM, WNN, or log on to muskalaw.com and watch the program stream live. Thank you for joining us. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Like most men over 50, I get a PSA test once a year. This year's test, well, the results came back very high, seven, and I knew I had to find a top urologist and do it quickly. I talked with several of my friends in the medical field, including Barry Nevins. Amazingly, they all gave me the same name, Dr. Matthew Leaf, M.D., Dr. Leaf performed a biopsy, it was totally painless, and we discovered that I did have cancer of the prostate, but the good news was that because we had caught it at such an early stage, it was easily treatable. 80% of men develop prostate cancer at some time in their life. Ignoring that fact is not going to change it. If you're over 50, you need a prostate exam once a year. You want a doctor? who you can trust, a specialist in the field who knows what he's doing, and that doctor is Dr. Matthew Leaf, the doctor who saved my life. Located in Coral Springs, call 954-755-3801.